you know, uh, last week we we looked at the question of you know letting stuff go pretty much, and uh, then all week I struggled with letting things go. So that's how it happens. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, we're looking at power struggles. This is part two. It's a four-week series where every week we're going to look at a different question um, about struggle, power struggles that happen, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, okay, so when, 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 I was <laughs> when I was a kid, things seemed like a lot less, um, a lot less uh, serious all the time. You know, uh, it seemed like, you know, the world was fairly simple and, uh, you know, pretty much the entire world consisted of my block. And... Uh, you know, that everybody loved each other, I, I, I thought, you know. Obviously, now I'm an adult, I'm like, well, probably not. But <laughs> I thought that everybody loved each other. Everything was going along great. And, uh, you know, I, the, the biggest thing I remember about it was that the voting season only lasted a few months. That, man, I, and everybody getting real tense and everything as a kid. And I was thinking, man, I'm just glad I don't have to vote. And, uh, and now, now the voting process lasts four years. And uh, as soon as you as soon as you leave the voting booth, they're already campaigning for the next time around. And, and man, oh man, it's like you never get a break. Um, I, 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 people made me a promise. They said if you vote, you know, then you don't have to worry about it for four years. Lies, lies. Uh, in the meantime, the last four years of the news has been quite the bore. <laughs> It's like you can never get away from it, even though you know all all this talking really isn't fixing anything. You know, you have people over here, you know, uh, talking against some group and this other group talking about another group, and all the talking really isn't fixing or changing anything. But people still feel it's their, you know, uh, bread and butter, I guess, to to get each other riled up. And I I often find myself not just with this, but with a lot of things, getting frustrated with people uh, who are in power if I allow myself, you know what I mean? Not just politically, uh, any kind of power. Um, it seems like I could always do their job better. You know, and, I, and I'm sure you've felt like that before too. Uh, don't you ever feel like you could fix it if they just let you step in for five seconds, you just fix the problem? Don't you ever feel like that? I think we all kind of feel like that. And not, not just the control freaks in the room. I think everybody feels like that every once in a while. Like, man, I, I just know that I could fix this. It's like you're surrounded by people who don't know how to do their job. And it sometimes just gets a little bit frustrating. You ever feel like that? I, I, feel, I feel like that all the time. And uh, it, it's hard because, well, I can't do anything about it. So we're, we're, we're talking how, how, uh, how well we're talking about power struggles. And uh, <laughs> so we've been looking at four questions. Um, we're looking at power struggles on the four questions we have to answer with, with, with power struggles. The first question was from last week, what do I control? And it was basically the idea of learning how to let go. This week, we're going to look at who has God given me? And kind of the idea that I want to follow along with is to change how we see things that irritate us. And I, I hope that you kind of get what I'm saying, so I'm just going to try and break stuff down as we go. Um, so who has God given me? Now, but before, we get, before we get real far on this, there's going to be somebody who every time I say anything, they're going to say something along the lines of this. Are you saying we can't change anything? Are you saying we shouldn't vote? Are you saying we shouldn't fill in the blank? I'm not talking about pacifism. I'm not talking about going to war. I'm not talking about voting. I'm not talking about your American rights. I'm not talking about any of those things. I just feel like I need to get that out in the open, first things off. Because I if you get hung up on that point, you're not going to hear anything that I have to say. And so let's, let, let's, let's plow, play, play through, play through. Um, the first group, who has God given me, is the government. Now, I, I know that, I know that this, this is very irritating for some people. But <laughs> remember that without government, there, there would be a lot of chaos. And, and, and as much as chaos as there is now, <laughs> uh, remember that uh, the government really is a good thing, it, by and large. Now, obviously, we don't have perfect leaders, and we don't have a perfect system. I'm not trying to argue any of that stuff. But ultimately, the government really is a good thing. You know, it causes people to be able to get unified in a direction, which, you know, even if it's the wrong direction, at least it's a direction, right? 
Um, but one thing you have to remember about the government is that the news always makes it worse than it actually is. I don't know, a lot of people just aren't really aware of that, but any time that you watch the news, it's really not going to be the whole picture. It's going to be a very slanted picture. Um, this week, um, it's, a, it's a friend that I have on Twitter. I don't know if you guys use Twitter. But he posted, he was, wa he was in a, in a um, I think they're called bars, uh, uh, sports bar, that's what it's called. And they had two channels. Uh, one was Fox and one was CNN with the same person in the same interview. And the tag at the bottom read the exact opposite. So-and-so says they can't do this. So-and-so says they can't do this. It was the same interview on the same night, but two different news stations. Are you kind of getting what I'm saying? <laughs> the news always makes things worse. So it, if you're one of those people who watches Fox and CNN and you know all those different news ones, just remember that it's more like an interpretation of what happened. Uh, maybe you could even say it's science fiction that was based on a true story. Oh, go, all these things work. I mean, uh, just as long as you don't take them overly serious. You know, so when they say, oh, no, this is going to happen for sure and we're all going to die, just remember, okay, all right, past the hype of, the, of their rhetoric, there's a lot of things that are going on behind the, behind the scenes. Don't let, it, don't let it get you all riled up. Another thing is every rebel thinks that they have a reason. Every rebel thinks that they have a reason. Some of them have maybe better reasons than others, but every rebel feels like they have a, have a reason. Um, and the thing is, as Christians, are we building up or are we tearing down? Christians really shouldn't be too big on um, revolutions. Now, once again, don't stone me here. But, you know, our kingdom isn't on this earth. And we really shouldn't put too much time and effort just poking the bear. Does that kind of make sense? Um, if there's something you can change and something you can help, then by all means go and do it. You know, like, um, I, know I hear a lot of Christians arguing back and forth about the whole Syrian refugee thing. I'll, I'll do you want, whether the government should or shouldn't do this or that. I'll, I'll, I'll do, make it way more simple than that. Jesus told us to go. I don't care what the government says. We as Christians are called to go. Problem solved. So let the government do whatever they do, and we as people have to reach out and love everybody, right? See how simple that is? We, we complicate it by trying to make it super political. And the thing is, if you, if you read, really read um, the Gospels with how Jesus handled politics, it's amazing how he just, it wasn't his purpose at all. And he, and he didn't let it get him sidetracked. And I think that we would really do well to remember that. Um, so uh, power does corrupt, and power is corrupted by people. But the government really is mostly good. Think about, for instance, the safety that they bring on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and a perfect example of this would be um, Nixon, um, President Nixon. Uh, you know, I'm sure everybody knows about Watergate. But then also, they ended the Vietnam War, so hey, that wasn't half bad. And then they also opened up trade relations with Russia, so that wasn't half bad. So, I mean, there was good stuff going on. We just all remember Watergate. And, and I think that that kind of summarizes what I'm trying to say, of course. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of corruption, that kind of stuff. But still, the government does a lot of good. Um, and so when I, remember, what we're looking at here is who has God given me? And, and learning to see the irritations that we have in life as God working character in us. See what I mean? Seeing the irritations in life is something that God's using, God's working character in you. So, all authority, whenever you're talking about people in authority, remember that all authority is borrowed. And it's borrowed from those over you, and everyone is under authority. All authority is borrowed. Just, just remember that. You have authority because somebody over you has loaned you authority, and someone under you has authority because you have loaned them authority. Everyone is under authority. It is impossible to not be submitted to someone. Now, I know a lot of people have a hard time with the idea of, you know, um, a wife or whatever being subject to, to a husband and that kind of stuff. And I really don't want to get into that too much um, with the whole equality and all that stuff. But my point being, um, everybody is under authority of some kind. 
And all authority, all people in authority will be judged according to their ability, and, and that, that's absolutely true. But there's something that I think that we often, too often overlook, especially as it applies to the government. You will be judged by the same standard that you judge others. R remember that. I, I remember a couple years ago, and uh, really I, I'm, I'm not going pro or, or anti-president. I, I oh. But there was something that came out about the, 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 our current president and something that he said in locker room. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of people going back and forth, and so it's like they were trying to suck me into the argument. I said, I, I really just don't want to don't get involved in this argument. But um, they kept going, and one thing that I said was, I said, well, do you look at porn? And there's this person who was so condemning of President Trump, oh, blah, 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 blah. I don't see how that applies. And it's like, well, so you're looking at pornography. You're looking at naked women and then you're condemning him for saying a rude comment about women. So maybe you should get off of porn, which is the greater evil, before you condemn him for saying something behind closed doors that was inappropriate, but still was none of your business. See what I mean? You kind of get what I'm saying here? Taking the, the speck out of somebody else's eye when there's a huge log in your own. You know, pornography is actually aiding and embedding sex trafficking which, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there's a, there's, there are more slaves today than there were before the Civil War. That's, that's a frightening statistic. And uh, I, I think that we, could re we should remember that any time that we're talking about pornography, because if you, if you are watching pornography, you are, it, it, it literally builds the sex trade. And uh, I, anyways, I, I hope you kind of get where I'm going with there. I think that the, the, the lesser of the two evils was what President Trump said. Just, just throwing that out there. Um, once again, I really don't want to get into pro or anti or anything. But uh, so remember that you will be judged by the same standard. Only the perfect can demand perfection. You cannot be repentant and condemning. You cannot be repentant towards God and condemning of others at the same time. It, it's impossible. And let me show you guys some verses. Matthew 7, 2. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard measure, it will be measured to you. Okay. Therefore, this is Romans 2, one. you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. You cannot be repentant towards God and condemning towards somebody else at the same time. It, it, it's, it's impossible. It is impossible. Besides the fact that if you don't love people, even, see, you're judged by how well you love the person you hate the most. I'll say that again, just in case you didn't understand what I said. You're judged by how well you love the person you hate the most. That's the standard. It's easy to love the people that you love to love. It's hard to love the people that you love to hate. There's a big difference there. So, okay. I've noticed a lot of times that when, when people talk about stuff with the government, I, I notice that it's mostly just comes from a rebellious attitude and, and not so much from anything in particular, just from that rebellious attitude. And, uh, sorry, I double-clicked there. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And I think that these verses really do apply. So here's one more thing I want to look at here. Uh, before we move on to the next uh, thing that God's given us, is, and this is oftentimes just completely overlooked, is the idea of living at peace. In 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, and verse 8 says this, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving. Ooh. We don't just have to pray for them. We have to be thankful for them. Oh, that, that's, hard for, that's hard for us a lot of times. Um, be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority. Now, you really have to get the picture, the historical picture, as to why this is so significant. The emperors had finally seized power in a very public way. <laughs> they weren't doing it politically anymore. They were actually calling themselves emperors now. And they kind of just gave up the fantasy that they, that they weren't, that, that people's rights really didn't matter anymore. And uh, the emperors were not very nice people. They were very immoral people. Um, very, very immoral people. Uh, <laughs> if you think you know what a bad leader is, you don't know anything until you, until you see what these guys are doing. 
but in the midst of that, this is what Paul says, in the midst of them having such a corrupt and evil emperor. That really blows my mind away, guys. It, it really, really does. Um, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Wow, that kind of goes against everything that we hear. Now it is about, you know, uh, speaking out and all these different, you know, things that are going on in the news. Uh, oops. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? And hopping down to verse 8. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Okay? It's very important because uh, a lot of times when we're talking about things that really matter to us, like politics, it's easy for us to become angry with other people and to just kind of turn things into fights. And uh, obviously this is not good. So I, I always hear people say, yeah, but, you know, you have to call out the evil. I'm like a prophet, you know, calling out the evil. Well, here's the thing. What is the result of you calling out the evil? Is it, is it resulting in stirring up people who are already irritated at the government? Or is it resulting in greater righteousness? See, a lot of times people will, will sit and they'll talk about, oh, those stupid Republicans or those stupid Democrats or this or that or the other thing. They'll, they'll badmouth President Trump or President Obama or whatever, whoever they don't like, it, it doesn't matter. And then it turns into this whole thing. Well, I'm sure you guys see what I'm saying. Now, I'll go ahead and go to the next point because I, I think that anything else worth saying is just going to um, be repeating stuff that I've already gone into. So the second, uh, more of a group, if, if you will, of people that God has given to us is the church and a boss. I, I, I put them in the same category because I have similar things to say about both of them, but, uh, but still. Did you know that you do things that your boss or the pastor or leaders don't like and they do stuff that you don't like? Did you know that? See, oftentimes what we do is we, we sit back and say, I, I don't like how they do this, I don't like how they do this, and I don't ha they don't like stuff that you do too. But what we do is we sit and nitpick other people and then refuse to see our own problems. Wow, you know, I'm kind of making their job not very fun. I'm kind of sucking the fun out of their life. Well, I'm really getting in the way with every little thing. My boss asked me to do something, and every single time that he asked me to do something, I always have something smart to say. I always, have, I always have to correct him on what he told, he told me to do. See what I mean? If I was to hire someone, it wouldn't be so that they can give me philosophy all day. I hired them to do a job, so do the job. And it's kind of something similar that happens with the church. People kind of get this idea that when you're in a church that it's kind of like, I don't know how to say this. Um, it happened real bad when I, in the churches that I grew up in. Kind of the idea that the pastor is subject to me. He has to perform up to my notch. And if he doesn't uh, perform in the way that I expect him to, um, then I can talk bad about him and it's justified because he's not doing it the way that I would do. You kind of get what I'm saying? And, and, it's, and it, we, we sugarcoat things and make it sound better when the truth is if you'd actually just stop and... We were reading Chronicles of Narnia and uh, there's this part where, where Lucy sees Aslan the lion and she's the only one who does. And Susan says this after, afterwards. She says, you know, in my heart, I really did know that he was there. I just, I didn't, I wouldn't let, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let myself pay attention. And I think that that's oftentimes how we are with stuff like this. We see that we have a heart problem. We see that we have an attitude problem. But we, if we would just sit and ask God, change me. We would grow, we would mature, but the problem is we don't say, God changed me. We say, I hate it when they do that. See, it's a complete different outlook. One of condemning a friend rather than being repentant towards God. And, you know, here's the thing that I, the things that you learn, you know, no matter how much I grow, I've found that there's more areas that I need to grow in. See, when I got out of college, I grew a lot spiritually, and I thought, man, oh, man, I'm really the top at the rung here. There's nothing else for me to do. I might as well start, you know, helping other people to reach the great lofty heights that I have attained. And, uh, you know, I, I overlooked the simple fact that I still had growing to do. And we all get to those same places.
I, I'm trying to figure out how much to, to say. Your boss is responsible for the job, just like a pastor is responsible for the church. See, when you're not in church leadership, you don't think about it. You think you should do things my way. But a pastor is responsible to God. And if we as pastors do not take that role seriously, do you read the prophets in the Old Testament? A lot of them are God condemning the church leaders for not watching out for the church. See, if you go to a new church and you cause a problem and you leave, it's not really on you. You just float to another church and cause another problem somewhere else. But as a pastor, you don't get to just float around. You don't get to go to another church. That's your church and your church, and, and it's on you. It's your fault. And if you let somebody come in and destroy the church, it's on you. Just like when you work for somebody, it's the boss's responsibility. And if you do a bad job, it's on him. You'll just float around to another dead-end job. But the boss, he's left hanging. You get what I'm saying? When you deal with your authority, with people over in authority over you, a lot of times we kind of dumb stuff down and, and we assume that they have the same amount of responsibility as we do. I thought that pastors didn't do much of anything until I became a pastor and I'm only an associate pastor. And now I'm seeing how much stuff he has to do and I'm like, I'm looking for my exit ramp here, guys. <laughs> most problems now, now, now. This applies to um, I mean, this applies to most leadership that you're going to face in your life. And remember this one because this is this is a tip that will help you in anything you do to succeed. Most problems come from your own nitpicking. Now, let me elaborate. Okay, Mo most problems are impossible expectations or something that they're not even responsible for. For instance, pastor, I can't believe that Melissa did this. Uh, time out. What? <laughs> See what I mean? It wasn't his responsibility, and all of a sudden I'm throwing, throwing him under the bus. You kind of get what I'm saying here? And I'll give you some more examples here. And this applies to bosses and other people too. You always have to have the best attitude. You always have to do everything right. You always have to have better sermons. You always have to get have to give. We we get this a lot. People come by the office a lot. You, you, you know, you need to give me money. Well, I'll help you get a job, and I'll help you manage your money. I'll I'll I'll, I'll help you. I'll stand beside you. I'll, you're not going to give me money. Then you're just not doing God's work. And it's like, well, that's not really fair. See, God's entrusted this money to us, and we have to do it, use it in such a means to benefit the church. And we have to think about the future and those kinds of things. And uh, honestly, I, I will say this. If we gave out money to everybody who came to the church and asked us for money, the church would be bankrupt in two months. I promise you. There's that many people who come by. I'm, I'm not joking. Um, and, you know, pastor deals with a lot of them that I never see, and I deal with some of them the pastor never sees, and I don't bother telling them about it because... <laughs> Why would I tell him about that? I know what he's going to say. So most problems that we have are, are, are dealing more with your ex impossible expectations. The Bible says that pastors and, and leadership and whatnot, they're supposed to be above reproach, not above nitpicking. And there's a really big difference there. Um, an overseer then must be above reproach. So that means basically, um, okay, if the pastor's sleeping around, ah, that's not being above reproach. If the pastor did something that you didn't like, that is being above reproach. You see the difference? Nitpicking is where you are holding a fine-tooth comb, you know what I mean, and micromanaging everything. And I'm not just talking about pastors here. I'm, all, I'm still talking about uh, leadership in general. And uh, I think that this kind of really sums or summarizes this point up very well. We oppose those God positions to work in us. See, authority is kind of like a chisel. And God's using them to work us into a diamond. But the problem is, is that we don't like this process of being hammered at. And we think it's not fair. And so what we do is we just oppose these people, even though God has positioned them in our life to work in us. Did you ever realize that no matter how hard you run, you're going to run into people that you don't like and who kind of rub you the wrong way? You can't get away from them. It's like, man, I thought for sure I left you back in California. And here you are again. You know, and for those of you who don't know why I moved from California. 
Um, so who else has God given me? Your spouse and your family. Now, if you're a kid, I would say more so your family. If you're an adult, I would say more so your spouse. Um, the way to make the the way to make strong families is to have strong marriages. And and I know that a lot of people will say, "What about single people?" I don't know how, but God makes a way for single people. I I don't know how. God just has a way of fixing it. But if you are married, and I am talking to those specifically who are married, it's important that you that you build a strong marriage. Now, oftentimes I hear I hear people say, "Who is the head of the of the house?" And people go back and forth arguing about this, back and forth and back and forth. And I would say they're both wrong because Christ is the head of the church, not the husband. This is a very important point. Okay, Ephesians says that the, head, the husband is the head of the wife, not that he is the head of the household. There's a difference. Christ is the head of the household. Uh, the husband is the head of the wife. The wife is the head of the kids. You see how the kind of progression goes there? It's a big difference. Ephesians says this, be, sub- be subject one to another. You wives, be subject in this way. In fact, in the verse that says, be subject wives, it's in uh, chapter 5, verse 22. Be subject is actually not in that verse. It's in the verse before it. It carries over into the next verse because he's showing you how to be subject. Wives, be subject like this, as to Christ. And then he says, and husbands, act like Christ and be subject to your wives in that way. See, what I oftentimes hear is I hear people basically being tyr- tyrants. I get to make all the, all the shots with the money, and I don't, my wife doesn't get to have any role on that. Well, is that acting like Christ? Well, no, not really. See, I mean, there has to be some kind of mutual agreement there. That's what a marriage is. It's a mutual contract. Um, and sometimes husbands, a lot of times, have a hard time... <laughs> Stopping and asking for our wife's input. I mean, y- you guys are married. You know what it's like. You, I know what I'm doing. It's faster if I just do it. Just stay out of my way. You know. But wives, they like to talk about stuff. They like to help with stuff. They like to get involved. I'm not criticizing that. Uh, I'm just saying that we as men might be, might be better off to, to learn <laughs> and to adapt. Because God has a way of showing us what's bad in us by our family. Did you hear what I just said? God has a way of showing us where our character faults are through our family. Let me give you some examples, and, and I'll go into this more next week. I, I go to leave, and my wife says, where are you going? Going out. Where? To the store. What for? For milk. Is that it? if I would have told her where I was going in the first place, so right there, I'm not communicating well. Then there's a second thing, I'm being inconsiderate because I could have asked her if she needed anything while I was out. You see what I'm getting at here? Our wives nagging is the way that God chooses to show your character faults, husband. Do you get that? When our wife does something, that shows us how we aren't like Christ. That's hard. But here's something I have learned, and this is a great relief. Do you know that women usually aren't, aren't real power hungry? They may act like they're power hungry, but it's usually because they're just wanting more. You know, there's a hundred different things, but I'm going get, to get sidetracked there. Men, we are the ones who have power struggles in the, in the relationship most of the time. We think we have to subject our wives. When Ephesians says, wives be subject, it doesn't say, husbands, subject your wives. Do you notice the difference? The difference is in my attitude and how I am focusing on the situation. If my focus in my marriage is on subjecting my wife, it's not going to be on being loving even as Christ loved the church. See the difference there. And if my wife is focused on subjecting herself to me, she's not, she's not going to be going to be nitpicking my character, is she? You, you see what I'm saying here? I, I hope that that kind of makes sense. And here's just a, a kind of an important point. Why is we created not to be a servant to the husband? I, I think that that's kind of overlooked a lot of times. God gave Adam a job in the Garden of Eden, and then he gave Eve the job to help him do that job. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so let's go through a list of things that that does not mean. 
That does not mean that it's her job to do the dishes because it's both of your dishes. That does not mean that it's her job to do the laundry because it's both of your laundry. It does not mean that it's her job to take care of the kids because it's both of your kids. You both had the hinky pinky, you both clean up the mess. And that's just how it works. You don't have to like that's how it works, but if you don't like it, then don't get married. See, what's happened for a long time is us husbands have, taken, have, have said it's okay to be subpar in our, in, in our job as a husband. And it's made weak families. And what I'm saying is us husbands, I don't care what your wife did or said, I don't care. You as a husband needs to step up and be Christ to the household. That's what our job is. You know, it amazes me that us as men, man, we do great things. We, do, we, do, we build monster houses. We build bridges. We do all kinds of amazing things by our hands. If we run, run, run a company, we read books about how to do better. We listen to podcasts about how to do better. We're always trying to be better leaders, better this. How can we never stop to say, how can I be a better husband? That bothers me because the majority of my marriage has been spent trying to get Gracie to be a better wife. Do you see the difference of perspective there? And it's illuminating once you realize to fix yourself. Fix yourself. Well, I really don't like them. Fix yourself. There's this part on Chronicles of Narnia. I, I, love, I love reading. I don't know if you guys knew that. There's this part on Chronicles of Narnia where I think it's Lucy. She's trying to talk about how it's, how it's Edmund's fault. That's her brother. It's his fault, and Aslan just growls at her. And then she says, do you mean to say that I need to just butt out of what's, what you're doing with Edmund? And he says, yeah. I'm, I'm talking to you, Lucy, not to Edmund. It's like, oh, oh. And I think that that's how God sees it when we start talking bad about someone else. Mind your own business. You work on you. Well, that's a bit different of perspective. Now I'm going way too long, so we better get going. Um, you know, your wife works all day, and when you come home, sometimes we have this idea that now it's her job to make me food, so she doesn't get to get off of work, but you do. See what I mean? That, that, that doesn't sound fair. And I will say this. Women have a natural tendency to connect very well because they don't talk with words. They talk with emotions. Did you notice that? You know, in the part of the Bible where it says, men look at the, at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart, I think that there should be an addendum there. God and women look at the heart, but man looks at the outward appearance. And I'll, and I'll tell you why I think that is because did you know that if you offer to help your wife and you don't really want to help your wife, she'll say no even, that she, even though she wants you to help her? I want you to want to help me. Oh, well, isn't it enough that I offered? Difference of perspective. So listen to the words and the emotions. Try harder to connect and love. Be present with your kids. Most family problems could be resolved by, by a father just being present with the kids. Chuck said it a couple weeks ago, your kids don't want a bunch of things. They want you. Just be there, dads. Just be there. That's it. Just, just be there. You would be surprised at the, the, the change that that can make. So oftentimes we as husbands kind of take this attitude. <sighs> Why should I try that hard to connect with my wife? Why can't she just say what she's thinking? Because that's what Christ would do. Christ would try to understand her, and we are supposed to love our wives like Christ. So I've shown you, I've shown you a few different areas um, of authority, and we've asked this question, who has God given me? And, and that leads us to this, this conclusion that I really want you to grasp onto. Start seeing irritating things as necessary things. When you learn to stop complaining about things in your life and embracing things in your life, it changes everything. You can give new meaning to, to terrible things, the death of a loved one, a tragic job loss, all kinds of terrible things that could happen in your life. You can give it new meaning. New meaning where instead of it holding you back, it can propel you forward. And that's a powerful thing. See, irritating things as necessary things, we can learn from it rather than try and fight it. What have your kids been doing? So, uh, how, what has your spouse been complaining about? What has your boss been writing you about that shows a need in you to grow? And how do you handle it when they do? Kids are little, are little mirrors is what they are. Ever, ever have kids do something that, that just drives you up the wall? It's probably a mirror of some sort of character flaw in you. Find out what that character flaw is in you and fix that. 
fix that. Why? Because God wants you to be more like Christ. See what I'm saying? Does your wife, is there something specific that your wife nags you about? Fix it. Fix it. Is there something specific that your boss rides you about? Fix it. Learn to grow. And when we start seeing these, pe- these, these people that are over us as people that God has placed there, it changes everything. So how do your reactions and others' complaints show your own character flaws? What have, uh, well, I guess I'll stop there. As you grow, you'll have new bridges into other people's lives. As you grow as a person, it'll make new bridges into other people's lives. We want to be a bridge into somebody else's life, but we don't actually want to have to change to do that. We just want for people to be drawn to us, and then we can say, Jesus, yo, and then the problem's over. But it doesn't really work like that. It doesn't work like that at all. People usually see Jesus with how we act towards other people. In fact, to put it specifically, the Bible says this, they'll know that you are Christians by your love. Are you getting along with people in the church? Are you getting along with the leadership in the church? Are you getting along with people who are just visiting the church? Or are you like, oh, you're not one of us yet? See what I mean? Like, what's going on there? And that will show you what's going on there. So we're going to go ahead and stop there. There's a lot more that that, that could be said, but I've already gone way too long. I've probably gone for an hour and a half. It's probably midnight by now. There's people falling asleep in the windows, falling out. And uh, uh, so we're just going to go ahead and stop there.